Thank you. 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 And interchanges ideas and his conferences. Uh, she's done seminal work on intonation. She and J. Pierre Humbert wrote a wonderful book on intonation in Japanese. Um, she's written several other books as well. Uh, she last summer helped organize at Ohio State a great workshop for graduate students from all over, which I participated in, um, to uh, teach. Um, students more about phonetics and phonology. Uh, she was the editor of Journal of Phonetics, and I have a warm spot in my heart for that <laughs> since uh, during her tenure I contributed a paper there. Um, but uh, she organized a very she organized a special issue, which I think is pretty widely cited. I mean, the papers in that special issue on early child language uh, acquisition, particularly with respect to the sound structure of language. Uh, she continues to be a very prolific contributor to the fields of phonetics, intonation, prosody, uh, and leave anything else. I'm flattered. Oh, and let me say, let me say, let me say that she's an expert in Japanese, and by no, uh, no, no accident, because she is a child of missionaries, right? <laughs> right. Who grew up in Japan, as I remember. I so was born there. Yeah. Fluently bilingual. Uh, not anymore. Not anymore? Okay. So I, I without think... taking up any more time, Mary's going to talk on the effects of some lexical pattern frequency on the production accuracy in young children. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. <clears throat> right, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about some work that I've been doing with uh, several people. Uh, most prominently, Jan Edwards, who's probably the person I've been collaborating with the longest. I've been collaborating with Jan for nearly two decades now. The um, uh, question that we've been uh, asking ourselves recently is, where do phonological constructs, things like phonemes, syllables, stress patterns, where do they come from? And the hypothesis that we've been gradually coming to as a good working hypothesis is that they, they develop these phonological constructs, they develop representations of these phonological constructs based in part on generalizations over patterns in the lexicon. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, first of all, very quickly review a little bit of the prior literature that suggested this hypothesis to us and also suggested ways to test it. And then I'm going to uh, talk about two studies, one that we've just submitted to JCL and one that we're um, uh, still in the progress of uh, last stages of analyzing the results of. And then I'll summarize and uh, relate the results to this larger question that we're starting from. OK, so the evidence in the literature that suggested this hypothesis to us comes from two ends of the, the process. Uh, infants, before they started to produce their uh, first words, or when they just started to first th produce their first words, and adults. Uh, if we look at uh, infants, what we see is that uh, there's a lot of work showing an influence of the ambient lexicon on babbling. Uh, so uh, Benedicta Bosson-Bardia and her colleagues showed in a, uh, a paper in the mid, uh, late 80s that if you look at the spectra of vowel parts of babbling in 10-month-old babies, and you do this for babies that are growing up to speak Arabic, babies that are growing up to speak Cantonese, babies that are growing up to speak uh, French, you'll find that uh, there are differences across the three groups in the distribution of spectral patterns in the vowels in babbling. And those differences reflect the vowel spaces, the frequencies with which different vowels are exemplified in the lexicons of those three ambient languages. Uh, similarly, uh, de Bosson-Bardy and Marilyn Demon in a um, 
uh, paper somewhat after that, looked at somewhat older infants, infants uh, that had just started to produce their first words, and uh, looked at uh, the frequencies of different consonants in these first words, but also in the concurrent babbling. Children don't stop babbling when they start talking uh, right away. And so they looked at the consonants in the nonsense, the babbling that was going on at that time, and found that uh, the frequencies of different consonant types reflected the frequencies of those types in the ambient language. So uh, uh, children who are acquiring French still continue to produce many more labials than they do dentals and feelers because labials are more frequent in French. Children who are acquiring uh, English and uh, Swedish, on the other hand, uh, stop producing so many labials in their bowels, start producing more dentals. Dentals are more frequent than labials in uh, Swedish and English. Okay, so the question that uh, we want to ask is, does this influence of phoneme frequency continue to affect productions at later stages, after the kid has acquired more than 50 words and the vocabulary has started to uh, expand uh, quite rapidly? Okay, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, if you look at adults, uh, we know that pattern frequency, sublexical uh, phony sequence frequency, uh, affects both perception and production. So a paper that Jen Hay, Janet Pierre Humbert, and I presented at Lab on 6, we looked at uh, uh, adults' identification of nasal obstruent sequences embedded in nonsense words. And uh, what we found was that uh, we asked the adults to uh, rate the word likeness of these nonsense words and then to write down what they heard. And uh, they identify high frequency sequences much better than low frequency sequ sequences. And when they misidentified something, uh, it was far, far, far more common to misidentify a lower frequency sequence as a, a higher frequency sequence than the other way around. Okay. In production, similarly, Mike Nivovich and his colleagues have, uh, they, they've used a uh, shadowing test, a speeded uh, auditory timing task, asking adults to repeat nonsense words as quickly as possible. And when the nonsense words contain high frequency phoneme sequences, they're much faster at repeating them, at initiating phonation, than when the nonsense words contain only low uh, frequency sequences. Okay. Uh, I've also uh, mentioned the word likeness, word likeness judgments. There are a lot of uh, studies now that show that adults rate nonsense words that contain uh, high frequency sequences as more word like than those containing low frequency sequences. We also know from work that Susan Gatherpole and her colleagues have done that uh, non-words that adults have judged as being less word-like will be repeated, imitated less accurately by children. Okay, now these are the children between three, two and a half to uh, eight years of age, the targeted range that Jan and I are looking at. So the question uh, that that immediately uh, posed to us is, uh, Shouldn't we expect then that children in these same age, range, age ranges should be less accurate at repeating nonsense words with low uh, frequency sequences? Okay, so the two experiments that uh, the two studies that I'm going to talk about. One is uh, a study by Kyoko Yoneyama and Jan and me. That this is the one that we've just submitted. This, here we targeted the, the phoneme frequency question, although you'll see as we go through that <coughs> phoneme sequence frequency kept coming up. Uh, and then the second one is one that uh, uh, has been uh, about to be ready to submit for several months now. <laughs> uh, it's going to be out by the end of this month, we hope. Uh, um, and uh, this is one looking specifically at sequence frequency. The first uh, study then, uh, here, uh, the question we're asking is, uh, do we see effects of phoneme frequency in these older children? Uh, and our, our line of reasoning went like this. In English, T is more frequent than K. T is also acquired sooner. It's um, uh, children who uh, are, have phonological problems 
um, even when they're older, are much more likely to substitute T for K than the other way around. Okay? Some people looking at this have said, well, that's because kernels are defaults, that universally T is better than K. Okay? Uh, but it's true that T is also more frequent in English. So we need to look at a, a language where that's not true to see, to separate out the two possible explanations. So we want to look at Japanese, because Japanese, in Japanese, K is far more frequent than T. If you look at a typical dictionary, the words that start with velars or palpalized velars are a good quarter of the dictionary. Okay. Uh, so the question we want to ask is, is that difference in relative frequency of K being more frequent than T, also true of the lexicon that's going to be ambient to the child, is it true of child-directed speech? And this is an important question because we know for some other things in Japanese that the adult lexicon and child-directed speech are different. So if you take three, three more words like sakana, kuruma, uh, that shape, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, consonant, vowel, is by far the most frequent shape for three more words in the adult lexicon. But if you look at child-directed speech, it's um, long syllable, short syllable is more frequent. So words like ne ne, uh, uh, bu bu, and so on are more frequent. Uh, so first of all, we wanted to make sure that this, this uh, fact about T versus K in the adult lexicon is true of child-directed speech. And if it is, we wanted to see how that affects acquisition. Um, so to address uh, the first question, what we did was we tabulated uh, token frequencies of word initial T and, K, T and K using the MTT database uh, uh, to confirm the earlier uh, uh, statistics that Kyoko had uh, uh, gathered using an older uh, online dictionary. And uh, we also recorded uh, 30 minutes of interaction uh, between an infant and a caretaker from each of five infant caretaker dyads. And uh, Kyoko orthographically transcribed all of the child-directed utterances, all of the caretaker's utterances in the examples, and we checked, the, the, checked them. And then tabulated the total frequencies of the word initial T's and K's there. And here's. Uh, uh, before I show you the results, um, uh, I'm going to show you the results only in front of a, uh, e, and o. And here's why. Because if you look at phonetic t as opposed to phonemic t, uh, phonetic t only occurs in front of a, uh, e, and o. Okay. Uh, and if you look at k, uh, you can make an argument that phonetic velar k only occurs uh, in front of ka, uh, uh, ke, and ko, and ku, and not in front of ki that there it's the palatalized variant. So looking at T and K only before vowels where phonetic T can occur, here are the statistics we found. In the adult lexicon, sure enough, uh, uh, T is, is much less frequent than K in front of A uh, and in front of O, although not in front of E, which is the lowest frequency vowel in Japanese. Uh, and in the uh, 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 Child-directed speech, that's also true. T is less frequent than K uh, in front of A and uh, O, but not in front of K. Okay. And the statistics about, you know, only uh, uh, four occurrences of E in the first syllable of the words in, in all of these 30 times five minutes. <clears throat> okay, so then uh, to answer the second question, address the second question, we, uh, uh, recruited 47 children, ranging in age from a little bit uh, older than two years to a little bit older than five years. And uh, we presented them with 18 target words that had word initial T or K, followed by uh, the, the three vowels, A, uh, E, or O. And we elicited them using pictures. For example, T in front of O was Tora. Okay. Uh, K in front of O was Kuara. Okay, koala, right? Um, and uh, uh, we elicited five repetitions uh, of each of these words and used only uh, repetitions where uh, two out of three transcribers, at least two out of three transcribers agreed and the bursts weren't clipped because we want to do some spectral analysis uh, of these. Uh, so for one of the kids, here are the 
uh, uh, four usable tokens of Torah. By this time, he's having kind of fun with the picture. So uh, two out of those four were transcribed as having uh, initial k, and two were transcribed as having initial uh, uh, t. Uh, t. Uh, so two out of the four were transcribed as having initial t as the target is, and two had initial k. Okay. Uh, looking at the results overall, here's the picture. We're plotting here for each of the children, from the youngest to the oldest, the uh, mean percent target T that were correctly pr produced uh, as being transcribed as T, uh, mean percent target K that were correctly produced as K by the trans tran uh, transcriptions. And you can see that. Uh, uh, the kids are acquiring these pretty quickly. Okay, so by by three, all the kids have T and K. Um, uh, if you look at the younger kids, um, they get K sooner. So if, if they have a difference, they're better at K. They're more accurate at K than T. So the opposite of the pattern in English. Okay. Uh, Looking more closely at the errors, um, remember that in English, the most common error pattern is uh, uh, T substituting for K. The opposite, K substituting for T, as we saw and heard in two of those uh, tokens of pura, is very rare in English. Okay? In Japanese, uh, uh, first of all, just looking overall, uh, we found one pattern that couldn't be explained in terms of phoneme frequency. The uh, uh, errors just in voicing. So trans transcribed do for to, transcribed go for ku were uh, very frequent and uh, equally distributed, even though uh, the go are less frequent than to ku. So if there's any kind of universal, uh, the um, uh, this would be it. Uh, on the, uh, on the other hand, uh, when we look at uh, other types of errors, what we found was this, that um, uh, there were more errors for T than for K. We've already seen that on the overall results. And surprisingly, there were most errors in front of X. So T was, uh, had more errors than K and K. K had more errors than K and K. Okay? So, Error, there were more errors other than just plain voicing errors in front of et, the least frequent vowel. Okay. Okay. Uh, looking more closely at the place errors for uh, T, what we find here, I've summarized it, but let me just show you. Uh, there were uh, uh, many backing errors, so backing to uh, k or g. Uh, there were also backing errors or manner errors on to back to ch or ja. And uh, unlike the backing errors to uh, uh, velars, the backing errors to palatals were predominantly in front of et. Okay. Uh, for uh, k, uh, there were Fronting errors, fronting errors predominated, unlike in English, and uh, uh, just as in English. But uh, what's interesting is that most of the errors were in front of et, and many of these errors were, as many of these errors were errors of k being substituted by cha or ja rather than ta or da. Uh, and uh, substitution of cha or ja, the applicant cha or ja for uh, either K or T is, is almost unheard of in English. Cha and Ja are some of the last acquired sounds in English. Okay. Um, so how can we interpret this? Well, first of all, there's the, um, there's the, um, the overall impact, that backing of T, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, rare in English, rel relative, uh, rare, rare in English, uh, uh, is much more frequent in Japanese. And uh, one thing we noticed 
We hadn't checked the English statistics before. We're targeting initial, word initial position here. And if you look just at word initial position, uh, T isn't more frequent than K in English. If you look at all positions in the word, T is more frequent. But word initially, uh, T is not more frequent. And that's one of the places where you see backing errors in English. Um, uh, so we, we started to wonder whether you know, maybe, maybe the frequencies of T and K themselves isn't the whole story. Uh, maybe we have to look at what T is next to, what K is next to. Uh, there's another difference between English and Japanese, and that's that in English, front vowels are far more frequent than back vowels. In Japanese, it's the other way around. The two most frequent vowels are A and O. Okay, so uh, we wonder whether some of this difference, fronting errors versus backing errors, might not be due just to the frequencies of the stops themselves, but to the frequencies of the vowels that they're next to. If you think about uh, how a, a child might acquire T versus K, you know, you just slam the tongue up, and you know, wherever it lands, that's that's the stop. If it lands towards the front because you're about to make a front vowel be transcribed or sound more like a T. And if it lands toward the back, because you're about to make a back vowel, it might be transcribed as, as uh, a K. So maybe what we're seeing is really uh, not uh, precision in the, uh, not uh, acquiring T and K so much as differentiating a sort of what uh, Fiona Given calls an undifferentiated lingual gesture. Uh, and the differentiation uh, being better in front of the uh, uh, of the um, the targeting being more precise in in the front if, if front is is the sort of base of articulation back if, if back is the place of articulation okay um, <clears throat> and that then um, might explain why there's higher error rates for both P and K in Japanese in front of E, which is you know, a, a very infrequent uh, base of articulation. Uh, the substitution of cha and ja. Now, this one is a little bit more puzzling, because applicants aren't more frequent in Japanese than in English. Uh, if you look at uh, absolute frequency, uh, it's about the same in the adult lexicon. Uh, but there's a fact about Japanese, and that's uh, that uh, the applicants play a role in a contrast that spans the entire consonant system. Uh, all obstruents, labial, coronal, and dorsal, uh, practically all of them, uh, have plain and palatalized or plain and palatal counterparts. So uh, there's a pa pia contrast, a ba bia contrast. Uh, a non mia contrast, uh, and so on. And the affricates in this system are the palatalized dentals. Okay, so palatal, uh, uh, palatalized uh, uh, is, 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 is plays a, an important systemic role in, in the Japanese consonant in, inventory. Uh, and remember, too, that cha is the allophone of T in front of E. Uh, which is much more common than F. So here we can uh, we can uh, 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 make two have two guesses. One is that maybe uh, when uh, the child substitutes cha for t in pet, uh, uh, maybe the child's generalizing from e, the other front vowel. Uh, uh, and also, if we think about the um, the role of the affricates in the phonological system, maybe palatalization. Uh, is is you know it's, it's kind of a default articulation for lingual consonants in a way that it isn't in English. Um, but of course, all of this is leading up to saying that you can't just look at the phonemes by themselves. You have to uh, you have you can't just look at T and K by themselves. You have to think about what the, the neighboring vowel is. Okay. Okay. So I've, I've, uh, I'll quick. Quickly um, skip the summary and quickly uh, uh, go on to the next question, which is exactly that. Um, if we look beyond uh, phoneme frequency, can we find an influence of phoneme sequence frequency uh, on accuracy of production? 
Uh, if we look at more sequences than just Japanese cat versus cork, cat versus paw. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and if there is an influence of phony sequence, fre sequence frequency, uh, are there other factors that are associated with this, this effect uh, in a, uh, uh, a way that can tell us something about what phonological representations are and how they're acquired? Um, now here, one of the other factors that we, uh, John and I are particularly interested in is uh, phonological disorder. Okay? Phonological disorder is uh, uh, persistent age inappropriate misarticulations that you can't attribute to hearing problems because the, the, you know, the child hasn't had a history of, of ear infections. The child doesn't have any obvious uh, neuromuscular problem. Uh, and yet, uh, uh, at uh, older ages than the child should be, is still saying uh, T for K or, or W for R or so on. Okay. Uh, and in a pilot experiment uh, that Peter's actually seen already, this is our lab plan five paper, um, we uh, looked at this by, uh, we, we took a handful of nonsense word pairs where uh, we uh, matched a high frequency sequence like FT uh, with a low frequency sequence like FK, embedding these in nonsense words, and had children imitate them. And then we had a really gross uh, er, uh, measure of, of accuracy. We just said, was it right or wrong? So two phonemes in the sequence, uh, either one, both could be right, one could be right, or neither. Uh, and even with this gross, uh, gross uh, uh, measure, um, and even with as few subjects and as few pairs as we had, we were getting a difference between the kids with phonological disorder and the kids with typical phonological development. The uh, uh, kids with phonological disorder were overall less accurate, as you would expect, they're phonologically disordered, but uh, they were worse even worse on the uh, uh, sequences that were low frequency, that had low transitional probability. Okay, so what we've been doing since uh, uh, then is we've been expanding the study. Uh, uh, we now have 55 kids with phonological disorder. We haven't finished analyzing those results yet. We've got, when I um, sent, uh, sent you all the abstract, we had only analyzed 87 of the typically developed kids. We've now analyzed all 104. Uh, and we've also added 22 adults as controls. And uh, our stimuli now, we've got 23 non-word pairs. Um, uh, and uh, 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 each of these, again, the, the, uh, the um, elicitation method is the same. Each subject uh, hears each word uh, from a digitized file, uh, Rob Fox saying it, and then repeats it. So, oops. What? Oh dear. Um. Let me play you those files. Uh, perfect repetitions. Bump, bump, bump. I should have checked that on this.
uh, the pairs that are, uh, some of the thoughts that I was going to play for you, and one of them the kid said Faga, as you heard, and the other one he said Faga. Okay? Uh, and how we uh, measured accuracy then was this slightly finer, finer grain measure. Uh, on, in the old way of scoring, Faga, it would have been uh, the T was completely wrong, so it would have been one. Uh, We've now got a six-point scale where, um, uh, uh, where each phoneme in the sequence can have a maximum of three uh, points. So a consonant gets one point each for having correct place, correct voice, correct manner. Uh, the vowels have one point each for correct front back, correct height, correct tense lap. So the trois bob would have been uh, uh, would have gotten two points for correct voicing and manner, but one off, one off for uh, incorrect place. Okay. Uh, with the accuracy analysis, the results are that uh, overall, the kids were more <coughs> accurate. They were less accurate for low frequency sequences than they were for high frequency sequences. Or turning it around, they were more accurate for high sequences with high transitional probability than they were for uh, targets with low transitional probability. Um, we also uh, did a, another type of analysis that um, Ben Munson suggested to us. Uh, we measured not just accuracy, but fluency, where um, we gauged fluency by just measuring the duration of the phones, thinking that if uh, 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 a fluent production is a faster production. Uh, so for every Every pair where duration could be compared, where there was a comparable, comparable um, uh, segment, uh, we measured the uh, duration. And we only looked at uh, the durations when uh, productions of both members of the pair were produced correctly by the child. Okay, so, so we're uh, adjusting for the fact that uh, uh, the, the younger kids would be slower and, and so on. Okay, and the result, this is, this is an interim result. We haven't finished um, uh, making the duration measurements for the uh, kids that we've added since the abstract, but uh, for the 87 kids that we had measured when uh, I sent you the abstract, there was a small but consistent difference in the uh, direction that we expected. And this is consistent with uh, Ben's results uh, it, dissertation results for uh, more sequences. Okay, now uh, looking uh, at the other factors that would be correlated with this, that would um, uh, be, uh, uh, <coughs> interact with this effect, one is age. So uh, <coughs> the younger subjects are less accurate overall than the older subjects, but uh, they're even less accurate for the low frequency uh, sequences than they are for the high frequency sequences. Okay. Um, now, why, why would this be? Why would there be an, a bigger effect of transitional probability on the younger children? What's, what's different between the three to four year olds and the seven to eight year olds? Well, one obvious difference is that three to four year olds have small vocabulary. Okay, so uh, could this be a maturational effect? Well, if it were just a maturational effect, you, would, you wouldn't expect to see this interaction. So we looked, at, uh, we looked at the size of this effect, the size of this difference, and correlated it with the size of the vocabulary. Uh, so we calculated a familiarity effect size by subtracting the accuracy of the low frequency sequence from the accuracy of the high frequency sequence for each pair, and then sum this across all 23 word pairs for each child. And we correlated that with the vocabulary size as measured either by this test of expressive vocabulary size or this test of uh, receptive vocabulary size. These are two standard tests. We did that with age partial out and what we found was that there was a significant correlation with age partial out. Okay, when we correlated the size of the effect with age and the size of the vocabulary partial out, there wasn't a correlation. Okay, 
Um, here's the uh, correlation with, of course, this, uh, this is the box for age isn't uh, partial dot here, but you can see that's the relationship. The, uh, the larger the vocabulary, the smaller the difference in accuracy between the novel and the uh, high frequency and, and low frequency sequences. Okay. Um, so, um, what, what you might ask then is why? Why are, uh, why are we getting low frequency sequences particularly uh, inaccurate for children with smaller vocabularies? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons why that could be the case. It could be that <clears throat> Uh, now, if you think of, of the kinds of representations that you have to build to be able to produce, imitate a nonsense word, uh, uh, the phonological representation is going to have uh, a representation of the, of the uh, acoustics. You have to be able to perceive the sequence and parse it correctly as being this, the uh, particular sequence that it is. You have to have a representation of the of the motor control. You have to be able to, uh, it's a novel word, so you have to be able to pick out bits that correspond to smaller parts than, than whole words and put them together to, to make a, 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 a motor score for a new, new uh, a, an utterance of something that you've never said before. Okay. Um, so it could be just that uh, the bigger your vocabulary, the uh, uh, more practice you've had at producing things in different contexts. So maybe you have a more robustly sentimental representation. You've heard T in enough different contexts that when you suddenly hear T in, a, in, in the context of a phoneme that you've never heard it around, you can still process it. Oh yeah, that's T. I know that phoneme. And you can then uh, extract away from the motor score for T in front of A, T in front of B, and uh, sort of make a generalization. OK, I think I can still make T, even though it's in front of something I've never produced it in front of before. Okay. So it could be just that uh, the kids are they're getting a more phonological phonology. They're getting a more symbolic representation of the, of the um, uh, phony, symbolic in the sense that purse meant, you know, it's an index that gives you, you know, you, you, if you parse this, then you can immediately generate this, okay, uh, where, you know, you can think of the mapping between the acoustics and the articulation as being like the mapping between the uh, sound and the meaning, okay. Uh, uh, another possible explanation is that if you have a bigger vocabulary, the the chances are greater that you've actually encountered a low frequency form if it's an attested form. Okay, so it could be that if your vocabulary is bigger, you just have a better, better grasp of the phonotactic. So it could be a higher order generalization that uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> Whenever I think about this explanation, I, I, I remember a story that Jan told me from a uh, work that she was doing with Peg Leahy on specifically language impaired children. One of the tasks was uh, lexical decision. Is this, a, is this form that you just heard, is that a word or isn't it a word? And one six-year-old kept saying, well, it's not a word I know. <laughs> so uh, a young child hearing a two phony sequence well, it's not a sequence I know, uh, but maybe it is a sequence in the language. The larger your vocabulary, uh, the more confident you can be in saying, well, that's not just a sequence I know. That's not a sequence. Uh, it, that's not just a sequence that I don't know. That's not a good sequence. So uh, it could be that either the kids are, uh, have more robust phonemic representations, or it could be that they have more robust phonotactic constraints, or it could be both. Okay. Uh, to tease that apart, what we decided to do was to uh, partition the low frequency transitions into those sequences that were low frequency but tested, like pop. Okay, pop actually does occur in few words, like pueblo. 
okay? Uh, versus zero frequency, MB. There are no words in English that end in MB. Okay? Um, if, it's, if it's a matter of giving better phoneme level representations, then we shouldn't see a difference between these two. And uh, uh, both of them should be um, worse for kids with smaller vocabularies. So you, you have to be able to predict uh, how good the kids with larger vocabularies would be on both of them from how good kids with smaller vocabularies are. Okay? If it's a matter of, of learning the phonotactics, on the other hand, what you should see is that uh, uh, these are better than you would expect from these. Okay, that the performance on these by kids with larger vocabularies should be better than you would expect by their performance on these relative to kids with small vocabularies. Okay, so we did two things. We partitioned the children into two groups. You know, the kids with the big vocabularies, the kids with the small vocabularies, or the kids with the bigger vocabularies and the kids with the small vocabularies. <laughs> and uh, divided the uh, low frequency ones into two groups, the ones that were low frequency but attested and the ones that were zero frequency. And uh, what we found was that both explanations hold. Okay, that um, here, here what I'm doing is I'm plotting the mean accuracy scores by item for the uh, kids with the large vocabularies against the mean accuracy scores for that item by the uh, kids with the lower vocabularies. And uh, the open circles are the high frequency, the, the familiar sequences, and the pluses are the low frequency unattested ones. Okay, and you can see that these are, uh, are pretty much parallel. These, these are really the same function, with the low frequency attested ones being down here, the uh, high frequency ones being up there. So the, um, the, uh, and, and the, uh, they're converging on x equals y. But uh, the kids with higher vocabularies are better. They're, they're above this x equals y line. So they're better than you. Then, um, then uh, uh, they're better on the unattested ones than you would expect from the accuracy of the low of the low vocabulary kids. Okay, so they've got more robust representations of the phonemes. They can produce the phonemes in sequences that they've not only never heard but never are going to hear. Okay, but they're even better on the ones that are low frequency but attested. Okay, so they're both, I, I think uh, one way to interpret this, if you buy our, 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 uh, our uh, story, is that uh, the children with large vocabularies have both made better generalizations, better robust uh, representations of individual sounds that, uh, that they can plug into new contexts. Uh, and they've made better phonotactic generalizations. <clears throat> okay, so uh, with this study, um, uh, summarizing our results, we've seen that uh, phoneme sequence frequency uh, influences production accuracy and fluency, and that the vocabulary size mediates this effect. Children with smaller vocabularies are generally less accurate but they're uh, even less accurate for sequences with low transitional probabilities. Um, uh, also, the children with the smallest vocabularies, so that for these children, accuracy on the unattested sequences looks just like accuracy on the attested but low frequency sequences, but the children with the largest vocabularies do markedly better on that. So, um, uh, <coughs> We've shown in these two things, uh, studies then, that uh, there's an influence uh, of phoneme frequency on acquisition and on the error uh, patterns in production. There's an influence of phoneme sequence, uh, sequence frequency 
and that this effect is mediated by the Cavalier growth. So knowledge of phenotactic regularities, uh, one of the results is that knowledge of phenotactic regularities looks probabilistic. And the theoretical implications then are, uh, I think this supports our, our working hypothesis that children develop phonological representations by generalizing over the patterns that they, they, that they uh, encounter in the lexicon. And uh, this matches well with a view of grammar as being not really, you know, here's the grammar, here's the representations, here's the grammar, here's the lexicon. But rather, the grammar is representation of generalizations in the lexicon. It's an emergent property of the history of interactions between the language user and the language events in the world. Uh, uh, or turning it around and, and thinking about it just in terms of uh, that uh, psychologists might want to think about it, uh, we don't want to make a distinction between well, here's competence, that's what we're looking at. Performance is what those other guys over in psychology look at. Rather, phonological knowledge, competence, is just the synoptic memory, uh, the enc encoding in rep long-term representations uh, of knowledge that's extrapolated from experience with processing, with performing acts of speech production and perception day in and day out. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so given that um, you're claiming that children are able to internalize generalizations that exist within the lexicon that they're exposed to, mm -hmm. the question is how do the generalizations get to be in the lexicon to begin with? That is, you take those generalizations, I take it that uh -huh. you would claim that those generalizations are partly sort of accidental, but perhaps you don't want to deny that they're partly based on phonetic and phonological Oh, universal. for sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, my colleague Mike Broke, the way he puts it is that languages have to be good to speak, good to hear, and good to learn. Right? And if you think about what a lexicon is then, it's the it's the vehicle by which uh, culture, grammar, can be passed from one generation to the next. And so it's going to, lexicons are going to naturally come to encode things that are easy to transmit, things that are good to hear, good to speak, and good to learn. Um, uh, so it, it shouldn't surprise us to see that uh, lexicons tend to uh, uh, tend to uh, not have too many things that are hard to hear, or too many things that are hard to say, or too many things that are hard to learn. They're, they're, they're going to be, uh, you, you're going to see the effect of, of the constraints of the vocal tracts, the constraints of the auditory system, the constraints of general things like, you know, redundancy is good, you can say that again. Um, uh, so, I mean, phonotactics, one of the things to think about phonotactics is that that's one way in which redundancy is encoded in the lexicon. Okay. Yeah? Why is it token frequency? In the uh, child-directed speech. To, yeah, that you're using to estimate these. Um, <clears throat> it was partly uh, a methodological issue, the, the difficulty of deciding What's a word type in Japanese? It, uh, Japanese has a much deeper morphology than English. I mean, with English, it's pretty easy to decide that this and that are, are uh, uh, instances of the same word. Uh, uh, with uh, Japanese, uh, okay, so if we take all tokens, no matter what the inflection of a verb, then um, then um, uh, we start getting into alternations that mimic some of the some of the substitutions that the kids make. Okay, and if we, once we do that, then we don't really have a good way of comparing to the adult lexicon where we don't have the inflected forms in the in the lexicon in the dictionary. Yeah. 
Okay. So, so I mean, that's a cop out answer, I know. But uh, uh, if we had a much larger database, I think we could begin to address that more effectively. And that's one of the things uh, that uh, Kyoko Chan and I would like to do. We'd like to. Um, uh, the, the study that you saw here, uh, by the way, this is a good advertisement for cognitive science. It was a summer project, a one summer project funded by an interdisciplinary summer fellowship from the Center for Cognitive Science at Ohio State University. Yeah. Um, Mary, I wonder if you, um, do you have any speech rate data on these things? No. My bet is that kids with bigger vocabularies might speak faster. I wouldn't be surprised. And if they speak faster, then they might, some of these sequences that are uh -huh. so-called impossible sequences might show up across word managers. Ah, uh, well, I think that all of these sequences we would expect to show up across word boundaries. Right. I mean, that's part of what I meant by redundancy, that, <laughs> that um, why do why do languages have phonotactic constraints? You know, why not allow anything to follow anything? Uh, you'd have more words possible if you did. Okay, but if you did that, then it'd be a lot harder to tell where the edges of the words were. Right. Right. True. True. Yeah. But but I just wonder if, in terms of one reason why you could, you know, you would get so much better at, especially at producing mm -hmm. these sorts of things is because you actually had made those kinds of articulatory gestures, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the sequence. And so right. it would be kind of interesting from that perspective. And then here's, a, here's, I mean, would you go so far as to say that if a kid's name is Swicker, he's more likely to have ZW than... I think so, yeah. 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 I mean, that's what we'll be, uh, you know, definitely a high-frequency sequence for him. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if some of the things that are, so in the experiments, some of the things that you looked at, especially like maybe CODAs, things mm -hmm. were completely impossible, and mm -hmm. then, then there were other, the other things that were very, very mm -hmm. low frequency, and you weren't sure whether the kids have ever heard these sequences, mm -hmm. like Pueblo or something. Mm -hmm. How can we be sure that this isn't a perception thing, and that the child is misperceiving, the children who make errors oh, are we misperceiving? Have no, we have no guarantee that it's not, and I'm sure that it is partly. Right. I mean, I, as I said, you know, I, I, uh, uh, this is this is not an experiment on the production phonology. This is an experiment on the phonology, uh, and uh, I, you know, uh, I, I'm of the school that says that phonological representations are are uh, beautifully vast and complicated things that include, you know. Uh, uh, things like you know, representations of gestures and how they should combine, and representations of, of acoustic events and how they should combine. Yeah, so we, we, we haven't isolated where in that chain the breakdown has occurred. Yeah. Uh, so there are, there are three little things that I'd like to look at in terms uh -huh. of um, what you count in order to make the predictions of the uh, accuracy. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said that in initial position, T is not more frequent than K mm -hmm. in English. So don't we predict that in initial position, uh, English speakers are more likely to turn T to K and vice versa? Uh, or that they, they shouldn't, I mean, it's not less frequent either, it's the same. We shouldn't, uh, if, if all we thought about was phonemes and positional contrast, and phonemes in particular positions, uh, uh, in particular prosodic positions, uh, like word initial versus uh, word medial, then uh, the prediction would be that uh, we shouldn't see any difference there. And that's why I think it's really important to look at what's next to it. The, uh, the, uh, most, the, the uh, vowel that's going to be following the T is going to be far more often a front vowel than a back vowel. Okay, so now we're not going to use the statistics of this, the consonant transition. We're going to use the statistics of the correlation between the frontness of the consonant and the frontness of the Right, that if, if, if uh, and what we're well, we, the right thing and not the other uh, thing. Uh, I think you have to look at both. Right? You, you should expect both to influence. So, 
Either way it comes up, then you win because there's one. Uh, well, one here's percent. here's what the prediction would be. Uh, the prediction would be that if you see errors uh, for T and K in word initial position, uh, if you see fronting errors, K fronted to T. Those are going to happen in front vowel context rather than back vowel context. And then if you see backing errors, if you ever see backing errors in English, T going to K, those are going to be in back vowel. And, and you don't make the same predictions about Japanese? Uh, in Japanese, it's harder to make uh, a good <coughs> prediction, but we do make the same prediction. Uh, the, it's hard because of, of, of uh, there's no T in front of E, right? right. Okay. But if, if you just look at the three non-high balls that we looked at, the prediction would be that if you, if you um, uh, have uh, um, errors uh, for, if you have fronting errors for uh, K, they should be in front of back balls. Uh, front vowels, and if you have uh, backing errors for uh, T, they should be uh, in front of back so, vowels. So it's the same prediction in the two languages. And, and, and the question isn't whether it's confirmed. The question is, if it's the same prediction, then it's not in terms uh, anymore of whether it's uh, frequency in the language or something more like phonological markedness that's uh, at work here, because you were looking to dissociate the two, but now you're making the same predictions about English and Japanese, so you haven't dissociated them anymore. Uh -huh. Right, so uh, I, what, what you have to do then is look at cases where, uh, where the uh, uh, phonological system makes opposite predictions. So I... I but see, I thought that's what the T versus K to be right. supposed to be. And then, when, and and then and and what I'm it. saying is that you can't just look at that. It's, it was obviously uh, a uh, naive prediction to make, that you have to look beyond it and look at the, the uh, system as a whole. And when we do that, then what we find is that the, the, um, the uh, pattern of errors for T going to, to chop in front of F make a lot more sense. And the, uh, the uh, pattern of errors being more frequent for, uh, for uh, K in front of F make more sense. Now, uh, uh, the error patterns, the, the increased error patterns in front of F is true both for T and for K in Japanese. Okay. Uh, that is not a prediction that you would make of English, and that's not something that falls out just from marketedness, because uh, it falls out from the fact that e is so infrequent in Japanese. The context is so infrequent in Japanese. Well, that way of counting the context is infrequent, but you know, if it doesn't work out that way, you can find some other way of counting the context, and we're just not so infrequent anymore. Like, oh, so then you start talking about you know front vowels or mid vowels instead of talking about e. It, Here's another case where there was an issue for me about what, what was getting counted. So you said twa and versus twa versus mm, right? Mm -hmm. And you observe different behavior on those two clusters for uh, kids with larger vocabularies, mm -hmm. particularly. Mm -hmm. um, well, what's the difference between those two? So uh, presumably it's not because they've heard pueblo or puissance. That's probably not the reason, right? I don't know. Uh, an eight-year-old might have heard quite well. I don't mind that for a second. So I think that's a terrible some... question. Uh, I mean, okay, well, play along with uh, Suppose yeah. it turns out that when you when you do a test of this um, in in the Southwest, you'll see a lot more pu, uh, and you'll still be left like, wondering why in parts of the country. But that's totally frequency. That's token frequency, not type frequency. And I think that's, that, that distinction between token frequency and type frequency is important. What about the word I am? I am? I am. How do you know they haven't heard the word I am? Oh, so you have a B in that. I do. Maybe they've been listening <laughs> to me. Uh-huh. <laughs> OK, they still would have just one token, the type of it. Well, there's well, it's one type. Uh-huh. So what's the difference? Okay, so uh, then we have to uh, uh, 
for children who've been listening to you and you uh, have been uh, uh, systematically making sure that they don't do a section in uh, second grade on Pueblo Indians, then yeah, we would make that prediction. Who are you know, pink panther? Uh -huh. well, uh, but but I, I think you know that the uh, the um. But there's I think there's a much more reasonable prediction to make, <laughs> isn't there? That uh, whatever it is about MB that makes it worse than a PW in English is a fact about it. It's a fact about the types of segments those are, and not the individual segments. Okay, to test that, we'd have to look across languages, but I thought that's what we were trying to do in the beginning. So I'm really looking for a way to tease apart. Uh, that's what we did in the beginning, and we came up with the conclusion that uh, you, you have to look not just at phony frequency, but also at phony sequence frequency. That, uh, that uh, 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 a word is not just a collocation of, of it is not just a, uh, 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 a random set of phonies, uh, that there are also phonotactic constraints. That the kid is, you know, the kid isn't just learning B. The kid is learning B in this context, B in that context, and after getting it out of all the context, B is a better B. Right? Yeah. How do these line up with? Now, I, I can't recall this, and I know the kids uh -huh. are, are younger, but McNeilich and Davis have arguments about which sequences, especially vowel consonants. Right. Consonant sequences are likely to show up. Right. In Babylon. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and those don't seem to be. Those don't seem to follow. Is my recollection is they're not. They're not like fronted because it's a front vowel or back because it's a back vowel. Uh, there's there's a kind it, of. It is though. Vowel. It is because it, uh, what they say is that uh, uh, it, the crisscrosses with the labials. Okay, so they're they're saying that with uh, 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 with um, uh, e and u, you would expect t and ku. Okay, and it's only with the low vowels that uh, you would expect you would expect pa t and ku, right? That the uh, with with uh, labials uh, the tongue is down and so the lips contact first in the upswing of the jaw. Uh, 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 when you, the kid raises the tongue, if the, if the tongue is postured front to make a, uh, a front vowel for the syllable, then uh, it will be contacting in the front region if, it, if, if it's back. So what we really need to do to sort out that markedness uh, uh, is find a language where either K is more frequent than T, but front vowels are more frequent than back vowels, or a language where uh, T is more frequent than K, but back vowels are more frequent than front vowels. Or a language doesn't have T, but one just has E, like maybe Y or something. Uh huh. And to and see what what the Ks look like. Yeah. 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 Does the language have repetition? Right. Right. Oh. Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs>